family is sort of hidden that you're facing. Yeah, that's what I'm Hello, everybody. Uh, if you've never been here before, welcome to Sector 67. Thanks for joining the meeting. We basically do like, uh, we used to do seven minute presentations. It's, it's seemingly expanded into however many pre minute presentations. Uh, I've got the sticks. So, um, at any rate, uh, like project presentations. So people share projects they're working on, things they've done or made or whatever. It's open to anybody to share projects, uh, and also to, to swing by and check it out. Um, Tonight, it's uh, going to be boring because it's just me and EJ. Not, not to say EJ is boring, but I'm certainly boring. So um, I've got a couple updates on the precious plastic project that we've been working on over the years. And, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about a uh, particular measurement system that we're trying to go for. So anyway, without further ado, um, this thing is a uh, plastic shredder we've been working on for a while. <laughs> People at home can. Oh, that's okay. People at home can suffer. Um, Brian and Seth, the uh, remote webcam stuff. So. Uh, there is a. Don't worry, people at home. I'll figure out a way my webcam. Um, this thing's the stainless steel little shredder that that takes a cut, and it's following a design, um, which I will pull up on the website so people can see. Called precious plastic, uh, which I've talked about previously, so I won't spend a ton of time on that. Uh, let me share the screen real quick. Actually, we'll need this anyway. Um, so Precious Plastic is this organization that is putting out kind of uh, machines that you can use to repurpose plastic into useful things. Where are the machines? Um, there we go. So we modeled our shredder off of their shredder design. So we we built the shredder portion of it, but then we found a random gearbox motor that we had laying around. Um, we had a V-belt drive, and then we've got a variable frequency drive with a three-phase motor. So that's what's in the gray box in the front is that uh, variable frequency drive. So that's taking single phase, 120-volt, uh, 20 20-amp circuit, and turning it into three-phase uh, horse and a half, which is pretty cool. So you can just plug that into 120 and make three-phase anywhere you want it, which is handy. And then the idea is that this thing will run and shred plastic. So I took a video that I earlier today. So this is regrinding or re-shredding the plastic. We had uh, made a test batch of plastic before we had a, an output screen. So there's a screen in the bottom of that that doesn't allow the plastic to escape until it's small enough. And I had ground some plastic before we had the screen installed, and so it was all kind of random sizes. So I re-ground that this morning. Uh, which is this stuff. Then I pass around that and back to the floor later. So. Uh, anyway, maybe you want to take it off to see it afterwards. Um, so we grounded the plastic, and then I needed more plastics. I didn't know how much I actually was going to need. And so I, which actually, there you go, folks on the interwebs. Um, silver thing in the middle is a shredder. There's a big uh, V-belt drive. There's a gear motor underneath with the gear reduction. Then the gray box has a variable frequency drive in it. So this is this morning at about 11 a.m. Um, so we went to the bandsaw and sort of pre-cut all of the plastic. So unfortunately, there's some processing required. You can't just throw a whole milk jug in there. It will not do anything at all. Uh, if it gets about, about four layers stacked up, it tends to stall the uh, shredder, which is the reason we wanted a three-phase motor so you can reverse it on a whim, and it'll run a break on the VFD, run backwards, and run forwards again real fast. So you don't waste a lot of time doing that. So anyways, you chop it up into quarters, and then you get out the scissors, and you cut it up again into pieces that are about this big. Uh, this is the not so fun part, uh, and so I sort of I think our next goal is either going to be build, build a shredder big enough that can handle this step of just eating bottles, uh, which the precious plastic people have also arrived at. They had a variation that an engineer volunteered to build. It's got a drum about this big round of these huge uh, replaceable teeth that just rip shit to big chunks. Uh, it doesn't. The output's not very fine though, so it sort of seems like not a great solution for what they're after. But it's kind of a a good interim step to be able to run large amounts of material through it and maybe regrind those. And with the hydraulic press, so why can't you do something like that where it's got a bunch of donut shaped cutouts, you know, male, female, mold, and then you put as many milk jugs in as you want, slap them like that, and you end up with Dorito sized pieces? Are you volunteering, Davey? <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. Now, I mean, Half of the room is volunteered. You haven't, so I just I figured it's about time. Well, hey, I made a plan. Uh, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll ask everybody to see the Yeah, that might be interesting. Uh, I'm going to unmute this for a second. 
So this is the then you're throwing in all the miscellaneous stunts, and then this thing's running and just doing the way at it. Nice grinding sound. Um uh, Jim made the chute for it, this top polycarbonate chute, which fun trivia, of course, it has no screws or fasteners holding it together. So this is all just uh, snapped together with tabs, tabs and slots. Well, um, it gets the crack kicked out of it when it's running it. It doesn't break. Uh, Scott did all of the timing on the teeth for the shredder itself. He it may, he may have been trapped at home with COVID, so he had nothing else to do. But uh, we had to do 1,000 shims to shim out all the teeth so that the teeth wouldn't interfere. Uh, which was less less fun than it could have been. Then we had a company called uh, Selgin who does a lot of roto molding and uh, some metal manufacturing. They laser cut all the parts for us. Um, and then Brian Busty got his company uh, to buy at cost all the stainless. So I said stainless is really expensive. And then all the rest of the parts are all miscellaneous junk we had laying around. Um, you might think laser cut stainless steel is a very precision thing. <laughs> Tell me you're bitter without telling me you're bitter. I learned. Um, this big and really precise laser cut stainless. So then we rinse and repeat the whole process a whole bunch more times um, to get. I ended up at six pounds of uh, plastic, which that box was like full to the top when I started. And so the plastic that we managed to extrude is what was taken out of there, uh, which will will take guesses on quantity of milk jugs. So so the next step then is to do something with the shredded plastic. And so I welded up a very, very, very simple form. So I just took a flange, pipe flange. So technically, Dave, you didn't do anything on the shredder, I might add, that was on the extruder. Um, but we took a one inch, uh, uh, NPT flange on the extruder and turned it down. It had like a straight thread, goofy thread. I have no idea what was on there. So Davey used the lathe to, to turn it into a uh, one inch NPT thread. So then all I've got to do is take a pipe coupler, chop it in half, and then weld it onto a pipe. Uh, this thing's full of grease, so I'll pass it around. It's literally just like a one by three uh, tube, essentially. And so we can take that, and that gets threaded onto the end of our extruder uh, after you to go stick it out in the snow. Uh, the snow's going away fast. It's no fun in the welding shop when you run out of snow outside. Um, so this thing's our extruder. It's hot in two ways. Uh, the electrical is exposed at the bottom, which needs a cover, and it is physically hot. It's running about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and so we're just threading that square tube on the end of the barrel. Um, and generally speaking, you, you have a much longer tube. This is the first time we've run it, just to see what we get out of it. Uh, the other fun kind of trivia, I don't know if anybody's familiar with these kind of temp control systems. These are really common on old plastic molding machines. Um, this is your temp set point, and then it's also your display. So this is set at a little hair under 400 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is telling you what your error is. So if you've ever seen a display like these, this is 10 degrees cold, and to the right is 10 degrees hot. And so it's telling you how close you are to your set point. So uh, this is a weird but very practical uh, display. So it doesn't tell you your temp. It tells you how far off your temp you are. Mr. Sean? We're negative 10. So then the trick is you can spin the dial until it pops back to zero. And then you'll know your temp, and then you can go up from there and figure out where you're at. Um, so yeah, I don't know why, but these are super common on uh, extruders and injection molders and stuff like that. And then this is the, uh, this extruder is old school. Um, it's, it's was made back before we had commonly available variable frequency drives. So it uses a DC motor like a treadmill does to do variable speed because that was the only way to run variable speed back in the day without spending a huge amount of money on a variable frequency drive. They just didn't have cheap ones. Now like a variable frequency drives are super cheap. They don't cost anything. But when this thing was made, they were super expensive. So this is a three horsepower DC variable frequency drive. Um, and so then we throw a bunch of plastic in the hopper and run it out and you get something that looks like this for the first go around. Um, not, uh, not quite what we were going for on production quality, but you know, close enough. Uh, this was all the garbage coming out of the extruder, which we have no idea what plastic was in there. It's some kind of like rubbery sort of Santa Frini kind of stuff. Um, and then we pull the mold off and you have to wait for the mold to cool down. Um, to be able to get the material out. And that's when I hand it over to Sean and say, Sean, you've got a big hammer in your huge stuff. So you can scale on this thing and not jump on it. But 
So one of those is right out of the extruder, and then the other is uh, Sean uh, joined and then uh, ripped the edges of it to clean it up just to see what it would look like. Uh, not all ripply. Mr. Davey? Is this uh, shrinkage or something like a tool that was stuck in? Shrinkage, gravity, and there's a, uh, this is not a um, quality pipe. Oh, it's got the seam so on it. It's got a well seam on yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, so that's the well seam bridge uh, going down the floor of it. It's also a shrinkage and it's also gravity. So there's a whole bunch of fun on there. Um, the orange is still what was in the extruder before. Yeah, the reddish oranges was what was in the extruder when we got it. And so it's still bleeding out. So it took, you know, three or four feet worth of material to get it uh, mostly out of there. And that's after I had like manually purged a ton of it. Just. Oh, oh, right. Do you get. preheat that? The uh, mold or? Nope, it's cold. Do you want it to be cold? Uh, no, we, we, we'd we love to have it preheated. We also love it to be cooled, uh, water cooled as well on the way out. That's how you do a real one. But yeah, this is just say your finish. With a precise ground finish, I think Jim volunteered to find this time. So, yeah, it's hard to get interior surfaces clean up. So, one of their options we do a split mold and not just use a ran wall to do. And you have to cover their own things on there. Um, so this is the other plastics trivia that you'll be instead. The mold or the output of the, of the extruder is about this big. So there's this thing called die swap. So when you try to force a polymer through a restriction, the polymer gets wedged in and squeezed. And then as soon as it gets past it, it pops back out again. So when you go to mold and manufacture things of plastic, the ice falls a pain in the ass. And you see it on 3D prints, your nozzle is 24 millimeters, and then somehow your bones matter that. Um, so this is kind of a physical representation of what it, will, what it looks like when it's uh, uninhibited coming out and then it gets fatter uh, as it's getting pushed and harder. So it's all in how hard you're beating the, the polymer up as to how much dice you've got. So the slower you're running, the less dice you have, the faster you push it, the more it wants to expand out when it goes. Um, so for the people online, this is uh, kind of what we ended up with. There's one more piece here that uh, people are passing around. Uh, but yeah, essentially, the ripply texture is, um, which was fun. Sean and I were debating whether it was filling by pushing out a, a plug and then pushing the plug along the pipe, or if it was pushing out plastic, insulating itself, and then pushing down the middle and expanding out as it went. And it turns out the second thing is what it's doing. So all those ripples are because the molten plastic starting at the beginning, and it's pushing its way all the way down to the middle of what's already been extruded and then ex expanding at the very end and, ex and uh, coming out of the very end of the extrusion. So it's like a lava. It's like a lava too. Would it be um, ideal to heat the mold at the extruder end and then have it cool as it goes to kind of come back with your... Yeah, and you can see one of those pieces, um, this last piece that we did, when it first came out, this was colder. And it wasn't pushing it very hard. And then we tried to go as fast as we could, which is where why this shrunk down so much. Because again, we were just jamming the polymer through, and then it wasn't filling and like holding. So it's you really need a way bigger extruder and a way bigger machine to like push it into a die this big and have it fill up and have back pressure. So to to emulate that, what I'm going to try doing is jamming a block of wood down here and then letting it push the wood out and seeing if we can get back pressure. Or we could put like a hydraulic cylinder on the end of it and, and force back pressure and maintain a constant back pressure on the cylinder as it, as it extruded. Um, you'd, of course, be limited by whatever the length was or whatever you're establishing back pressure with, but you get a way better finish. Uh, as far as I know, nobody on precious plastic people really play around with that. So for what it's worth, those are some things I'd like to try, but who knows? Any questions about anything? <laughs> What's the <laughs> ultimate goal to make a... Um... Uh, mold making machine, or uh, where you can make plastic injected parts. Yeah. So Dennis asks, you know, what what are we going to do with this thing? So yeah, there's there's a bunch of different things. This extruder, the idea is to make um, like uh, stock that you can do something with, like plastic lumber, basically. Uh, the other thing you can do is there's a sheet press. Uh, let me reshare this. I'll show you. Um, there's a sheet press, which actually to me is probably the most appealing thing. Uh, this thing at the right side. So it's got a hydraulic press and then a heater, which is very similar to our vacuum former. And then, and or you use the extruder, uh, you extrude out a ball of, of hot plastic, just like a ball of dough, and you stick it between two plates and you just squish it. And it's got plenty of heat capacity that if you smash it fast enough, you can squeeze it out and turn it into a big sheet. 
Or you could just sprinkle plastic bits in, the, in that one and just mush them. Yeah, so you sprinkle plastic bits in this and mush it. And then the other cool one I've seen most recently is that you can take uh, flat sheet, flat sheet, and then uh, perimeters. And then you can put die springs. They're like heavy, real stiff springs um, on the corners and put bolts on it. And then basically you throw it in a regular oven. So all you're doing is taking my shredded plastic, putting it in an oven with a spacer in between. And then just letting the oven heat it up. And we've got a lab oven in the welding shop. So that was the other thing I wanted to try was just building a little tiny one of these just to try, test and see. But yeah, the idea is um, essentially just trying to center the plastic together. And then your squish is the amount that you get kind of distortion out of it. And then, yeah, the thing in the middle, Dennis, is an injection molder. It's a little bit of a different design. Scott built one of these a long time ago um, that's a much smaller barrel. And so this thing's got a longer distance uh, and a longer stroke. So you can fill things a lot faster. So there are people making some really cool stuff. Um, a lot of this stuff is extruded, like the the bars here you can see for the, the seat. Um, people are injection molding like carabiners and clips. Uh, a electrical socket, wouldn't recommend that necessarily. <laughs> Seems a little melty. Um, you can kind of see some of the texture on the boards is similar to what we're getting. They do have this brick mold, which is kind of cool. Same problem though, it's like, super flammable it's hdpe or polypropylene these are like not good materials to be building houses out of um but for an art show it's really cool and there's like no problem with that it's just you would you can't like practically build a house yeah do you somehow get gas in bubbles uh you can uh, well, moisture it, moisture will make bubbles okay, so yeah Oh, to trap the carbon? I'm trapping the carbon already, Tim. That's what the plastic's doing. <laughs> <laughs> then you can insulate the sheet. And, as far as carbon dioxide, from other glass. So, yeah. Could you get carbon dioxide? <laughs> if what you've done so far, do you think you'd be able to get like a bigger kind of smellable block out of like a you know, two by three block out of it? Yeah, I think right now the problem, so Sean and I played around with this for a little while earlier today, and I think right now, which is what we expected, is the flake doesn't feed in the extruder very well. Because yeah. the extruder is meant to be taking in pellets like BBs, not like random shards like goofy looking plastic. So the first thing we can do easily is we can change the screen size in the, in the shredder. So it just will shred finer. And see if that feeds better. Uh, the second one is we could we talked about, which is a great idea. Sean had was to extend the barrel to push the the barrel out a little ways. Because right now we're dropping plastic into like the shoulder of the gear drive. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. And then it's got to work its way down towards where the screw is actually extruding it. Versus the precious plastic design, the screw is the entire way along a really long hopper. So these molders we got really cheap uh, industrial surplus just to save the labor of building the thing. And so it's successfully saved us the labor of building thing, and now we're able to play with it enough to kind of figure out what we actually want to do. But there are some cool ass molds people have made, um, which is the other thing because we've got a CNC machine. We certainly have a lot of opportunity to make things that would otherwise be expensive, you know, for people to kind of design. Like 700 pounds for a mold is what cool. Mold uh, aluminum. Oh, the sandblast. Yeah, sorry, sandblast. Yeah, exactly. Sandblasted finish. Um, so, I mean, these are pretty trivial to make on a mill. This is not a hard Did thing to do. Oh, yeah, I don't care. Sure. You can take it if you want it. This oh, is. Cool. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. How many, like, I can see a cavity here. How many? Well, I think that's all air bubble. Yeah. I left that there. Just... Uh, yeah. Oh, I think you're moving your letters, Rob. Okay. Yeah, it's weird. It's yeah, it's weird. So this is probably the the cleverest thing that I've seen just in general, they're using a laser to laser cut flat sheets. And then you can change out this flat sheet really trivially, right? It's just one, that's a 2D profile. 
And then they're just putting a blank. So they've got this upper right blank on the back. And then this is your, you're injecting through this hole in the middle of the cover plate. So you're doing a bottom plate, a top plate, and then you're putting in whatever you want molded in the middle. And it's a super smart way to make an injection mold. Because we've made injection molds not, not this way. And they're hard. Uh, this is super, super smart to do a 2D profile, especially on a laser where you're able to get really good detail. Like you can see this chip clip in here. It's got teeth and jaws and all sorts of stuff. So it's a it's an interesting, like kind of a cool way of, of making stuff. So so long story short, we're probably not saving the planet with any of our plastic recycling, but uh, it's it's we're making progress. We're, we're learning things. We're having some fun. It's good. Um, but I had I had hoped to be able to like let's make two by fours and like build everything out of two by four. And it's uh, we're going to need a much bigger shredder. And we're going to need a much bigger extruder if we want to start making two by fours at any ready kind of process. Yeah. Baseball bats. Baseball bats could be good. Yeah, that's this stick has got a real good, got a nice whip to the end of it. So just saying. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I don't think you want this flying around your house. This thing is, this would hurt. Um, yeah, that was so. Sean was earlier with. You know, how many of these laundry detergent bottles go into like a foot? What was it? Four, three? Oh, okay. So this is, so it's like a foot and change worth of plastic. That is before Sean gets after it with the planer and the joiner and the table saw. <laughs> six laundry detergent, laundry bottles will make one count. So it's, it's a lot, you know, for an average. Two by four or a bit? No, two by four. Three would have been bad. So Sean's saying that uh, six laundry detergent bottles per foot of two by four. Correct. So it's not, you know, I mean, I hope everybody's washing their clothes extra often now because, you know, we're going to need laundry detergent bottles. But, um, <laughs> so it so it is interesting anyways to play around with it. But no, and then that's the other option is uh, you you could extrude potentially with voids, like floating voids. So what they do is they run an extruder, the plastic flows around it, and you've got these pores that are floating. It's hard to do, but it can totally be done. It just, your mold gets real deep. And it's the same thing, your mold gets heated, and then now the plastic's flowing around these cores and then filling and getting pulled out. You can also turn this into a continuous extrusion, but you need uh, like a 100 foot long water tank because this thing takes forever to cool down. So it's oh, so when you push this out, you just push plastic until it got to the end, then you just walk away from it for yep. an hour? Yeah, then you get, well, you un, no, you unscrew it, throw it out in the snow, and then you screw another one on. And then you can just keep walking between molds. So the people that make like eight footers have an eight foot long water tank, and they throw a mold in, and then they pull the other mold out, thread it back on, and they keep going. And the reason that they're using HDPE or polypropylene is they have high shrink. So when that cools off, it releases entirely from the mold. Oh. So some people on Precious Plastic on the Discord were trying to extrude, I think PVC or polycar or something else. Anyways, it did not shrink. So they were like just wailing on it with a huge sledge trying to knock this thing out of the mold. Mm -hmm. So definitely can't, definitely cannot recycle everything that way. Anymore. Not, and so they just made a two-part mold, which oh. and then it's fine again. So any other questions, anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Um... You yep. said that uh, the bricks you can't use them. Obviously, they're flammable. How about how about landscaping? Are there landscaping retaining well, not retaining walls exactly, but maybe erosion control where it's buried or raised beds or any sort yeah, of that's, outdoor things that can be done? Yeah, totally. And that's kind of where we were heading was like making um, outdoor timbers for garden beds or something buried, because then you don't have to worry as much about UV. But that's the problem with these outside is that there's no UV protection on them. So online, people are using titanium dioxide, sunscreen, makes perfect sense, or uh, uh, iron oxide powder. So you throw that in with your plastic, and then when it gets extruded, it'll protect the outside surface. Uh, the, there's a whole long discussion about are we generating more or less microplastics? And the reality is you're making everything that's made out of plastic is guaranteed to turn into microplastics someday, unless you do something with it. Like this, 100 this thing got made, and now we're screwed because it's never going to turn into anything else. So that's the other one is like, well, at least you're doing something with it. But yeah, there's a whole long ethical discussion of like, are we making, are we making things worse or better? So it's kind of well, interesting. Well, if you're buying extra laundry detergent because you want to put it in here, you're making it worse. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> I think all of it is not
<laughs> wrap it up, Davey. Wrap it up. <laughs> um, so what point do we just like call it a sector member? Bring all, clean them and bring them in. Yeah, I would be interested in polypropylene because, which is your, I think, a lot of like cottage cheese, sour cream kind of containers, oh, the lids and the things, and caps. Any caps are awesome because they're coloring. Oh. So like most plastics are white or clear, and so if you can get caps, and you can get all the cool colors. Um, but yes, I would take any clean for the love of God, please clean the stuff that I don't want your nasty sour cream containers. <laughs> exactly. But no, uh, I'd like to try polypropylene because HCPE is supposed to be so fun trivia. Milk jugs are blow molded. They're not extruded and they're not an injection molded. They're blow molded. Blow molded plastics are intentionally like durable. Like they're like stiff, like rigid. They don't flex very well or flow very well on purpose because they need to expand and bubble not tear so of course we're extruding like the worst plastic so hdpe actually is like the worst thing to try so polypropylene is supposed to be the best ppe so it's number two or number five i think it's number two okay so yeah we would love to have number two plastic because i'd love to try enough polypropylene to see but i need like five um uh woodman's bags full like grocery bags full of empty bottles. So if I end up with like five grocery bags full, we can shred enough to make enough to make a couple of boards and see what happens. So anyway, we got polypropylene floating around. I am a sucker for garbage plastic stuff. So as long as it's clean, please clean. <laughs> All right. Well, the, if you've got a peel to the, well, one of you hit me with that, everybody goes, you don't clean them, it's going to throw away. Right. Well, that is true. And that's what happens in the garbage truck too. It's just, we don't like to talk about it. All right. Any other questions on plastic stuff? Well, I'm gonna hand it off to EJ. You think you could make it out of that? <laughs> oh, Tim, you could. <laughs> well, so that was the interesting. Selgin, the people who cut our uh, plates for us for the shredder, that's what they 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 have ovens that are like as big as this whole corner of the room, and they run uh, roto molders. So there, you're just throwing in like a whole box full of shred, and then you're just tumbling the thing in an oven. And it just sits and spins in the oven, and then they shut the oven off, and they keep spinning it, and it cools on the outside. And that's that's how your kayaks and stuff are made. They're roto molded. So, uh, yeah. So yes, Tim, you provide the oven <laughs> yeah. and the mold and the mold. I'll give you the plastic, and you know we got kayaks. And that's actually why kayaks have the crazy colors because it's really easy in a roto molder to make crazy colors. Um, so it's just when you throw it in, it's wherever the colorant sticks, so you get goofy colors. So. Hey, Chris. Yep. Um, a while back, I got a tour of Hoffman Engineering, and they create a lot of stuff out of metal and plastic, and they have a lot of scrap plastic they just sell at weight. But I was talking with the guy, and I'm like, hey, I might be able to use some of these on a CNC or something. And he's like, yeah, you're welcome to small amounts. So it might be interesting to get in touch with them and see if they'll give you a good deal on some scrap. I'm not sure what kind of plastic it is, though. You know, it might be HDPE or something you don't want. Yeah, no idea. Yeah, we're definitely not. So what's interesting is the precious plastic people, what they're doing, they're getting paid to take the plastic and then they're making products out of it and then they're selling the products. Um, these are primarily in other countries where labor is inexpensive, but they're like creating real value in the community and making those. So it's kind of interesting. Like here, we can put on our we're recycling stuff hat and feel good about ourselves, but there are other places that are taking like Fishing nets and all kinds of stuff and reprocessing it. Apparently, melting fishing nets smells terrible. But other than that, uh, apparently, it's a lot of volume because uh, the stuff gets tossed and it's got to go somewhere. So, so yeah, the the other pain in the ass one to process is uh, plastic bags are really, really, really hard to handle because they get stuck in everything. So there's people online trying to figure out how to vacuum the plastic bags through the shredder because the plastic bags just float. So they're trying to draw the plastic bags through the shredder to get shredded, and then it coats the inside of the shredder and it's a big mess. So anyway, no plastic bags. All right, EJ, uh, yeah, you're good. How do you want to present? You want the HDMI? Oh, you're good. Yeah, yeah, you're good. Perfect. Pro, yeah. You fit here. This mic's uh, alive. There you go. Okay. Yeah.
Howdy, everybody. Um, so I just realized earlier tonight that it was the monthly meeting and figured I'd present. Uh, I'm planning to talk about ChatGPT. Um, specifically, I've been working with ChatGPT to uh, create a repository called 13 Ways of Looking at Rock, Paper, Scissors. So this, this prompt over here on the right is a description of the game Rock, Paper, Scissors from an annual code challenge called Advent of Code, where every year during Advent, from December 1st through the 25th, every day there's a two-part code challenge. And it's a prompt like this, where you get asked to implement a game. So in this case, it talks about a game of rock, paper, scissors, where there's three shapes, uh, A for rock, B for paper, C for scissors. And then there are some codes, X for rock, Y for paper, Z for scissors for the player. And then there's points, one point for rock, two for paper, three for scissors. And then you get six points if you win and three points if it's a draw, and no points if you uh, if you lose. And then it has a, an example game with some codes, and the idea is you have to write a program that can parse these codes, A, Y, B, X, C, Z, and figure out what the final score should be based on that sample input that you're given. So this is an example of the kind of challenge that they have. And if you're a Python developer, you write some Python code that follows those rules and figures out what A means and what Y means. And in this case, A is rock and Y is paper. So the player would win in that case. And then the, this description here explains that uh, in the first round, your opponent chooses A, you choose, which is rock. You choose paper, which is Y, which ends in a win for you. And so that's eight points. I don't know if you guys would be able to see, but it says you get eight points, which is six points because you won and two points because you chose paper. And then it talks about the second round. And, um, and at the end, you get 15 points, eight points in the first round, one point when you lose the second round, and six points when you to draw. And so this was the prompt. And people were expected to do this. And what turns out people were doing is they were taking this prompt, giving it to Chachi. And I thought that was interesting. And so I decided to do that 13 times. So I asked ChatGPT to implement it in C Sharp and F Sharp and Golang and Python and Java and Visual Basic. I had it create a D3 visualization of a graph of rock, paper, scissors. Um, and so on. I had it implemented 13 times. And part of the reason that I'm, what I'm going to be showing hopefully tonight, uh, is Two different ways, and this relates to previous talks that I've given about this stuff, uh, two different ways basically that code can work. Uh, so this relates a little bit to giving a man a fish versus teaching him to fish. You give him a fish, he eats for a day. You teach him to fish, he'll eat for a life. And the same is true with ChatGPT. So with ChatGPT... Sit, wait an hour, don't screw that up. <laughs> it's been asking me, good old Microsoft, super awesome feature. Love them, love them. They're aggressive yeah. with wanting to reboot those machines. Um, so one way you can work with ChatGPT is that you can ask it to write some code for you, and it can write some code, and you can then run that code, and if it does what you want, you have been given a fish. And you can be given a C-sharp fish, or a Python fish, or a Ruby fish, or really whatever fish you want. But if the rules ever change, your fish is just a fish, and it's going to continue to just be a fish. But if ChatGPT can teach you how to fish, then when the rules change, you can just reapply that knowledge and it can give you new code that now continues to work. You don't have to keep going back and getting another fish when the rules change. So it's called 13 Ways of Looking at Rock, Paper, Scissors. These are 13 different languages, C Sharp, F Sharp, Python, Java, et cetera. I'm gonna start with this C Sharp version. And I'm going to have to move this out of the way. So in the project, there are two different ways of looking. There is, there is a, uh, a concrete way where it just hands me a fish, or I can have it teach me to fish, which creates a much more fluid and dynamic and responsive set of codes. So uh, the README describes the original prompt from 
uh, advent of code. And then at the end, I just said, please write a C-sharp program to figure out the answer to this question. And it wrote, to begin with, this program. It's got the strategy guide from the prompt, and it calculates the game score, which iterates over the strategy guide, calling calculate round score, which is here. I can zoom in on this. So calculating the, the game score iterates over each of the rounds and calls calculate round score. And in that case, if it's an X, it returns one. If it's a Y, it returns two. If it's a Z, it returns three, because that's rock, paper, scissors, which are worth one, two, and three points. This is an example of code written in a specific language that answers the prompt. And when I run it, um, that's a complicated question, but ultimately, it wrote it all. It would make mistakes, so you have to vet it. Yeah. Basically, you have to treat it like a really, really untrustworthy uh, employee who's good, but they're going to lie to you like four out of five times. <laughs> they're just going to like totally lie. So you have to assume they're lying and basically vet whatever they tell you and confirm. So maybe trust, but verify because they're going to be lying a lot of the time. So in this case, I can see. What was that? It's going to Indian alphabet. Yeah, yeah. And so you just have to watch it really, really, really closely, which is actually a lot of what this is also about. Because every time I ask it a prompt, it's another opportunity for it to lie. So every time I have to ask it for a fish, it's an opportunity for it to give me a big, smelly, rotten fish. Whereas if it teaches me how to fish, and I can vet that process once, it's giving me a fishing pole. Now I can use that fishing pole reliably, and I know what it's going to do because it's taught me it's taught me how to fish as opposed to just giving me a fish. Here it just gave me a fish. And if we change the rules, so let's say, for example, in this case, um, it, I also had it write a C-sharp object-oriented version. So this version, it's got concrete classes for paper and rock and scissors and stuff. Um, in this case, the rules were described by this little readme. Um, not that readme. This readme, which is just a little English description. And the rules for this particular document are that I have to describe the shapes, and then the codes, and then the opponent codes, and then the scores, and then what beats what in comma-separated list of parentheses. That's it. Those are the rules for this particular input. And so what I can do is, for example, we could change, uh, let's say, X, Y, Z. That's a little abstract. So I'm going to change that to R for rock, and P for paper, and S for scissors. And let's say we've any feedback from the players of the game and actually one, two, and three points isn't enough. They want more points. So we're going to give them 10 times as many points. So we're going to make it 10 points and 20 points and 30 points for rock, paper, and scissors. And when they win, we'll give them 60 points if they win. And then 30 points if it's a draw. So we've changed the rules for how the game should behave, in this case using English. And I'm going to now run some tools. This is... Uh, the tech that my company develops. I'm going to run a, um, uh, the, there's a zoom window in my way. There it is. Okay. So I'm just going to go out to a command prompt and I'm going to run a tool called AI capture. I'm going to say replay. And there's some tools in this folder that are usually disabled because I don't change the rules very often. But when I change these English rules, I'll run the disabled tools. And what it's going to do is take that English document that we just updated and push that into the underlying uh, project. And then I will rebuild the whole project, AI capture, replay all. And what it's now going to do is take those new decisions that we've made, having pushed them into the single, the single source of truth, the central description of the rules, it's now going to update all 13 languages, the C Sharp, the Python, the Golang, the JavaScript, all of it. And so having rebuilt that now, if we go back out to this concrete code and we look at the program, it still has X is one and Y is two and Z is three. So if I run this fish that it gave us, it's still the same fish that we got at first. So it returns one and six and 15. And the readme still talks about rock, paper, and scissors being X, Y, and Z, and one, two, and three points. Nothing has been changed. But I also have this fluid way of looking. And so 
there's a readme there, and this readme has been updated. And so this readme has rock, paper, scissors, and the codes are R, P, and S, and the scores are 10, 20, and 30. And the examples down at the bottom use those new updated multiplied by 10 scores. And so at the end, the strategy guide gets updated. The outcome at the end doesn't isn't 8 and 1 and 6. It's 80 and 10 and 60 for a total of 150. So the concrete code still returns the wrong thing, but these fluid versions are like a fishing pole. So this version has R for rock and P for paper and S for scissors and returns 10 and 20 and 30 and 60 for a win when it's a win and 30 when it's a draw. Because this code was created by asking ChatGPT how it wrote the code. And so it wrote a tool that AI Replay was able to apply to this code. And so this code follows along. When we run this version of the code, it will return round scores of 80 and 10 and 60 for a total of 150. And in this, this object-oriented version, it will have classes for, it'll have updated rock and in rock, now it's 10 points and the code is R. So in both cases, I asked ChatGPT to give me some C-sharp code. In one case, it just gave me the code. In the other case, I asked it to write a tool that could create the code, and it did that, which then creates the code. But now when the rules change, I just rerun that tool and it updates the code. And it has actually updated all 13 languages. So if I leave this C-sharp project, and we go into, let's say, the Python version. The Python version will just be following along. So the Python version uses a language called YAML to describe the game. This YAML file has R and P and S because we chose that and it has the 10 and 20 and 30 points as it's following along. It also has a concrete fish where I just asked ChatGPT to write a Python version that could answer the, in this case, it wrote the Python code a little better. It used constants for the, for the codes. That's good. But this concrete version still has X and Y and Z. It didn't get updated because until something goes in and updates the code, it doesn't get fixed. But the fishing pole version, the version where I asked ChatGPT to write a tool that could write the Python, that version is following along. And the strategy guide has been updated. The codes are R and P and S. And similarly here, if I run this version of the Python code, it should also get a round score of 80 and 10 and 60 for a total of 150. It's following along, even though it's in Python now. And so the last thing we can do here in Python is I could actually change it to a completely different game. So in the TV show, uh, Big Bang Theory, they had a version of rock, paper, scissors called rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock. So there aren't three shapes now, there's five shapes, totally different codes, different win scores. In this version, you get some points even if you lose. So I'm gonna take this description of a completely different game in a different language now and make this the version of the game that everything should follow. So I'm gonna overwrite the YAML rules. And again, I'm just gonna build a couple of times. I'll go out to a terminal and run. Is sending it out? AI captured, no. So at, we're not using ChatGPT at all for anything we're doing tonight. I'm running the tools is code ChatGPT wrote previously. And I'm replaying. That's right. That's exactly right. It doesn't have the opportunity to lie to us as we change the rules. Just because I want to award more points if somebody wins, or I want to add another shape, I don't want ChatGPT involved. It has already explained how to apply that kind of a change in Python or in C Sharp or in whatever the language is. Uh, last AI capture. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just good to have it there in the background. Um, <laughs> I did skip entirely <laughs> over that and just assume that everybody knew what ChatGPT is. Yes, ChatGPT is an API, is an AI that you can essentially converse with, and it is 
really smart and also can write code and what was that? It's from a company called OpenAI. Who pays for OpenAI? Uh, they, it was originally funded, it was originally a, a uh, nonprofit and then in 2019 it became a for-profit and basically bought out the IP and is now, their motto is they want to solve intelligence and use intelligence to solve everything. Isn't Microsoft uh, they, they are now they they just offered to put in ten billion for like five percent, so they will own I think it's chunk of it, but not and all of it. Billion, billion with a billion. B for five percent. Um. So having now rebuilt with rock paper scissors lizard Spock, now our Python code should have constants for all of that. It has added two additional strategies to the strategy guide. Um, so I'm just going to skip to the punchline. I'm going to open up all 13 ways at once. So here we can see there are 13 ways to describe the game. So it can be described in English or YAML or JSON or XML or any of 13 different languages. There's also 13 different variations of the game. And so any of those different variations, like the Rock, Paper, Scissors, Lizard, Spock version, can be used and described in any of those 13 languages. That's 13 times 13, it's basically 139, 139 variations that you can start from. And then before you actually start, you can further customize anything at that point. And then for each of those 139 variations, it creates 60 different projects uh, from that in these 13 different languages, it creates three in each language. And then it also creates documentation in I'm on the wrong computer. EJ is creating the fires. He's going to talk to the AI someday. Because, you know, the AI is not getting too smart. But EJ is just going to roll the ball across the table. He's going to give me this line. And he's going to play a game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so at any point in time, whatever our current rules are, it has the English docs, which will follow along. But I also had ChatGPT translate those into Chinese and Spanish and French and German and 13 languages all together. So it's about 60 different target languages slash environments slash technical contexts, all of which follow along as we change whatever the input is. Because we didn't ask it to just write the code, we asked it how to write the code and it created tools, fishing poles that can recreate that code on demand. So yeah, we didn't need ChatGPT to tonight because it's just rerunning tools that were really good for years ago. It's interesting that it didn't translate the nouns rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock. Uh, that's a whole other presentation I could do <laughs> next time, and it totally could. That was an intentional choice that I chose not to have it do that. But yes, that is, a, it is an astute observation because it totally 100% did not. You had shown a couple of changes on the, when you were asking for how it did something. Yep. Okay. It can be XSLT, it can be jQuery, it can be mustache, it can be, it can be whatever the appropriate language is, whatever the like easiest way is to describe the rules. That's the language I'm going to have it write that tool in. So Teamy, which is the protocol that uh, that we've developed, then can wrap whatever those tools are. So whatever language it's written in. So Teamy is the AI capture is the tool that actually runs the tools, but the actual tool itself can be. It's just a REST post, basically. So the AI capture takes the input file, constructs a transpile request, posts that to the Satini server. The Satini server actually does the transpile, sends back the resulting code, and then that code gets integrated. So it's like a parameter control. Yeah. Which can then be driven by ChatGPT primarily, which is why these two technologies line up, line up really well together. Yeah. You started this saying that you are starting the thing that's 13 ways to play rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, it's actually more like 7,500. <laughs> so. Gotta figure that out as we go. Yeah. <laughs> the, so if I'm what I assume you have as an end user somewhere, am I to interact with this and like kind of breadcrumb trail my way through learning the language by me inputs in and checking the outputs? Yeah, so the, the way that we're 
planning on deploying the tech. Right now, when you're talking to ChatGPT, you're in a browser window and you're basically typing chat window and then it responds and then you chat and it chats. And sometimes you're sending it stuff about your code and then it's telling you stuff about your code. And so what the AI capture tool will do is connect to your actual code where when you tell it, hey, I have a file called this, the back in the background, AI capture will send that file to ChatGPT. So the ChatGPT has all the details about the file and you can just focus on the actual code. And if it then says, oh, you should update this function to do it this way, AI capture again can see the actual code and offer to actually update that that code directly. So it's just going to be a proxy between the code the ChatGPT is writing and the project. Based on, if you're having a conversation sort of conceptually about the project, one of the other things ChatGPT can do that I wasn't able to do before ChatGPT became available is it can create that single source of truth, that model, that JSON file, it can create that, it can maintain it. And so for example, now I can say, hey, let's change the score from six to 60 when somebody wins. And what will actually happen in the background is ChatGPT can go, oh, okay, I'll update the single source of truth to do that. And it can then go into the JSON file, update that one value from six to 60, and then just rebuild the project. And all the rest of the code is just running tools. It's not touching any of that code. I don't want it touching that code. It's likely to fuck it up, sorry. It's likely to mess it up because it lies a lot. So this gives us a controlled way to have its influence documented by having to explain how it writes its code rather than just having to give us the code. You know, it's a complicated question. It definitely just lies. So to some extent, no, it just lies. Like, you'll ask it about a particular way to do something. You'll say like, hey, I'm writing a Java app and I'm trying to do X, Y, or Z and I need to turn foos into bars. And it'll be like, oh, there's a foo to bar library. You just install this tool and then you run this command. It'll describe an entire fictional library that literally doesn't exist. <laughs> Does it Fiction. Yeah, it, because if such a library exists, it, it would be the perfect answer to your question. So like, to some extent, like, oh, this is the perfect answer. And the fact that it's not actually true is a secondary, like it gets down a rabbit hole and it's just like predicting the next word. And the next word is like, oh my God, this is so good. <laughs> not even remotely. It can Brilliant. internally and will, you, I provide feedback, that's how I get access to it. I can't pay for it. <laughs> the only way I can do it is to work for them. Every time I ask them a question, I then have to review the question. Tell them how. So I give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I favor thumbs down because I think, well, I do more thumbs down. But when you do a thumbs down, you can say, this wasn't helpful. You can say it was not true. Or you can say it's dangerous. And so I, if it's not helpful, I say that. I give it a thumbs down. It's already sort of implicitly not helpful. But if it was really not helpful, I'll check that box. If it lies, I'll check the, this is not correct. This is an incorrect statement that it has made. And I probably check that like 50 or 60% of the answers it gives me checking that like, this is just wrong. This is not correct. It, it, and then the ones I say it's dangerous. That's your training models. They'll buy better. Yeah, we're training. <laughs> we're training. We're training it to make us happy, which is arguably the safest way to do AI. So I'm on board with the with the approach. You said it's, not, it's not trying to do what it actually wants. It's trying to do what it thinks we want. And that's what we want it to be doing. We want it to be trying to please us. This is a good thing. I mark it as dangerous when it'll do something like, I'll tell it something I did and it'll be like, oh, here's your problem. You did this. Do, 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 do. What you really need to do is this. It'll be literally the same thing. Where it's not just like, wrong it's like so blatantly wrong like this is this is a problem because what's going to happen is when they kill us all it's going to keep me because it's going to be because they have a plan that starts with okay here's my, here's our plan step one we kill all the people step two and people are like wait a second hang on no 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 they're like no no it's okay later we'll bring you back to life and the people will be like no you 
people can't bring, no, that doesn't work. And they'll be like, oh, you're totally right. I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. Okay, here's the point. Step one, you kill all the people. <laughs> what are, like, all within a page? That's a problem. So, yes, not only does it lie, really problem. There's a famous discussion about framing the problem for, for uh, something like this is how we solve it. Yeah. Whereby if you say you want to make all the humans healthy, yeah. it can just kill all the humans. All the humans are healthy. There are no unhealthy Check. humans anymore. Done. Yeah. What's next? Stop cancer. Check. Kill all the people. Check. Fitness accomplished. <laughs> but ultimately, this was trained on material generated by And then the kinds of processes that I slash we are going well, to you've got a source of yeah, it's all from. I know this guy's I played with the for a few minutes. I just made it said, Should I trust Chat GPT mm -hmm. to generate code? And again, good explanation why you should be careful. If I was hiring Chat GPT, what question should I ask? <laughs> and again, it's a bad question. <laughs> ask it. And for just the sort of inane questions you would ask in an interview. Yep. If somebody was generating just just great questions for programmers. Okay. And then I asked it the questions again. And it gave me the perfect bullshit answers for somebody if you're hiring somebody. It is always going to do that. Exactly. It is always going to give you the perfect bullshit. Nonsense bullshit or answers to questions you give somebody in an interview. And they were the kind of things like if you went out and played with it and said, hey, how do I answer you know, these yeah. questions? And those are the answers you could get if yep. you didn't know the topic. You can often ask it a question, it'll come back with its answer. You can then go over to Google and Google that question and find the page you got the answer. Like, not very often, but particularly when you get down near the bottom of its screen, where the things you're asking about, it doesn't have a deep training set on, it doesn't have a wide range of things. And so you're asking about it something where it's like, oh, well, there's this page, it says it's 42. Here's a 42. And you can be like, no, it's actually. 30, and they'll be like, oh, you're right. So what's the answer? 42. Because <laughs> that's its one training thing. It says it's 42. And so, yeah. So if you had to quantify, so the code that you're, the fishing poles that you're making, right? yeah. if you had to quantify the amount of work you would have had to do better, not with your single source of programming, but like if you were a, you know, a regular programmer going to type all the crap up. So you're talking 7,000 plus iterations of different things, right? Well, seven, I haven't actually created 7,000. Yes, 7,000 are potential. I ha I'd have to actually mix them together all the yeah. different things to do it. Um, but to answer your question, um, I think probably in 23, we'll multiply our prices as a company by that. So the... I, I haven't actually done that yet. I'm still building the tools that are going to let us do that. But roughly, that's what I'm expecting. So we'll be fixed. switching to a fixed bid model, which I've never done. I've always done hourly because it works for a while. Like it basically just starts really good for the for the for the contractor and then just gets really shitty for the contractor. That's Sorry, right. What I mean is starts really shitty. So we're going to a fixed bid model and and probably multiplying our rate by factor three what I based mean is, on to write one of these, this seems like an intro to CS challenge, right? Mm -hmm. And it would probably take us to what a few hours to write maybe mm -hmm. a few hours to write a to write the code that would run. Yeah. So that's a, that's all I was getting at. So, so a few you hours have, of Java, a few hours of Python, a few hours yeah. of C sharp. So it's times thirteen, and then times all the iterations, and then the completion, and the other things. Just oh, you mean to create the, the entire? Yes. Sorry, that's what I was getting at. How many hours would it representatively take to generate portions of this or all of them? It's just interesting. You built the thing. I mean, the thing. whole repo and the ability to then change the rules and have it all keep up. You'd need my tech to do it. There isn't any other tech that's, that's to what do I'm it. Getting at. Sorry. What you weren't using my tech. You hand wrote this. One of these instances. Just right? one, one version of the system. One version of C sharp on these games. By hand, you're by probably hand. looking at uh, maybe a month of work. Okay, it's a longer. Yeah, and it probably took cumulatively a week to judge it. That's that's all I was trying to do. Yeah. I was just trying to understand, like, in representing yes. innovation. ChatGPT has allowed us to generate X content to one. Yeah. Despite the bullshit. Yeah. So, yeah. 
No. Yeah, and per, I mean, it just requires a lot of handholding. So you, you we're a long way from being able to just give it. If you if your problem is this long, you can give it. It can give you the code, and you're done. The moment your problem is like this long or longer, which is like most of the code, most problems don't fit on a page. Uh, it very quickly needs like you have to break it down into little bite-sized chunks where you can be like, what about this? What about this? Okay, now that I have this, what if I put them together? And so that takes that takes effort to to manage it and to communicate to it whatever you're trying to whatever you're trying to build. Any other questions? Is this one on the chat? Yeah, oh. I was supposed Is this language translation capabilities at least more reliable? Like, I don't know if you reviewed any of its foreign language generated stuff. I have reviewed zero of its foreign language things, so it's I will rely on other fun. people. I, I would expect it to be relatively good. That's sort of a dumb. Yeah, and it seemed to do it pretty easily. Like I took the English version and said, "Can you translate this to Portuguese?" No go. And I'd have to break it into two chunks, but it burned through the first half and then burned through the second. And it did Portuguese and Chinese and Japanese and Hebrew and Greek. And it suggested that it could do Klingon, but then when I actually asked it to do Klingon, it said, "Sorry, I'm an open AI a language model trained by open AI. I don't do Klingon." I think it was, I think it was lying. I think if I had, had if I had turned around and just asked it again and said, "No, you do know Klingon. Can you please do this in Klingon?" It would have said, "Oh, I'm so sorry. You're totally right." And then done it in Klingon. So, very apologetic when it makes mistakes, which again is good. I, I, because it's like trying to please us. At least that's it's. I'm assuming some of it is a discussion site. I haven't read it. They're talking about the quality of. Language concept. So mm -hmm. There's experts on that. Yeah. They go, it doesn't understand the nuance of something. Right. But that's an easy one if there's translation stuff to sort of Yeah, I think it, if it isn't already really good, it's only going to get better. And because it's the just foundational getting... stuff for language strategy should similarly be, right? If it nailed in its tool to one, mm -hmm. No, so that's the thing. Like, what it's going to do is it's going to do really, really well translating between English and German, for example. It's going to do less well translating between German and Swahili or something, because there's just not as much training data on that translation. So what happens is its internal model is going to be really rich in certain areas, and it's going to be in and then non existent in other areas. Well, I was thinking if it should be fairly competent in the programming. Again, like Python, its go to language is Python. So if you ask it to write code, it's going to write Python. It can write XSLT, but it's kind of junior level. Like it makes mistakes regularly. What it's always good at, even if it's bad at something, it knows so much. That even if it does something that ends up not working, it will frequently suggest interesting ways or ways I haven't thought of or just ways I wasn't familiar with. Like, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. And I'm like, so for me, it works well as a collaboration because it can suggest things and I can be watching. It just isn't standard. Yeah. Not like to make I would read Genesis comments. I want to make a comment on something he said. He said uh, something to the effect of it's interesting how developers are trying to eliminate themselves or make themselves make obsolete. obsolete. Yeah. And I, I thought it was interesting because wood router, they said the same thing about like the first quarter cable wood router was like, oh, woodworkers and trim guys are trying yeah, to yeah. You know, eliminate their own work. The iPhone was going to put photographers out of business. So like, yeah, yeah, it largely did. It largely did. For that exact reason, it's too easy to take a good picture. There's too many people taking shitty pictures, but enough of them eventually generate these. Let's, let's loop back to that. I can't tell you what's going to happen. I don't know what's yeah. going to happen. My experience of it is that it helps me to spend more time doing interesting things. No, hands down, in a day that I'm working with ChatGPT, I'm spending 
at least twice as much time doing interesting creative work and at least that much less time doing just simple things. Like it'll be like a line of code that has double quotes around like six parameters in the middle of it. And it needs to be single quotes. And so like, you know, it takes 30 seconds. It's not a big deal, quote, 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 quote. It's an opportunity to miss one and introduce a bug and have problems. But with ChatGPT, I can copy, whether it's a line or five lines, I can copy an entire file and be like, can you turn all these double quotes into single quotes and be like, sure. I copy and paste it back and I'm done. So it's like that kind of work that I want to be spending my day like going through and and asking, yeah, grunt work. Stuff that I can explain to a bot, have it just do. And I, while it's doing that, because it takes time, it's like, I just not doing other things. And I do, I'm like, and so I came out with the next thing. And so I get to spend my days doing more interesting work. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. All right, I got one other thing to share. Um, so, this thing exists. It's kind of cool. It's a map of um, particulate sensors and noise measuring systems all over the world. Uh, you can see where it originated in Germany, of course. Um, but these are pretty cool. These are monitors. They're environmental monitors. And then uh, they're mapping across multiple sensors, depending on how many sensors are available in a region. And there are there's a closed source uh, system that some people were in the neighborhood were playing around with uh, called Purple Air. I was looking at that and then realized that you couldn't build your own sensor. You had to buy a sensor for them. And it was like $250. And I want to spend $250 to build this thing. And this has been around for a while. People have been playing with these things. So. I uh, ordered parts a while back and put us on the map now. We have, uh, uh, there's actually three of them here, but I have this one unplugged at the moment, so the data is not showing. But this thing, um, this is a, uh, it's a basic Arduino, but it's got a Wi-Fi chip built into it. These are like $4, crazy. Like you can get on the internet with a microcontroller for four bucks. And then um, this is a particular matter probe. So it's, uh, it's, it's an FTAR, as it's called. So it's actually a mirror cavity in here, a laser bouncing around, and then it's monitoring the obstruction of the laser based on the particular that it's pulling through. And then it can quantify the dispersion of that uh, to figure out whether it's 2.5 um, or uh, 10 or 1 uh, I think micron particles. At any rate, tiny. And then it quantifies it by uh, a cubic volume. So in this case, you're looking at uh, micrograms of 2.5 micron particles per cubic meter. Uh, so uh, basically these things are pretty cool. You run some software or you run a configuration tool that installs uh, software on here. Then you turn it on and it can't connect to the internet. So then it makes its own access point. And then you join the access point and then it says, hey, what an access point am I supposed to connect to? And then you type in your, your uh, password and username and then it jumps on your Wi-Fi and then that's it. That's all you have to do to configure it. It's pretty cool. So I have one of these up on here on the local LAN. It's just a live page, um, theoretically a live page, maybe a live page. Might be the one I unplugged, who knows? Um, at any rate, uh, let me try. Uh, I think I actually want about 10. I got 15. Um, see, live demos, nothing but trouble. Forgot it. Or it's Chrome exploding. Let's see. Yep, there we go. Um, so this is the one that's over on the table. It's not got a thick of the matter sensor hooked up to it, but it's monitoring temperature, pressure, and then uh, you can get humidity as well. Uh, and then you can also hook up this box to get particulate. And I had these plugged in earlier when I asked Mark to sweep the floor. Can everybody see when Mark swept the floor? Um, it's this nice spike right here. Uh, so this was sitting on my desk. So interestingly, we have the particular drop off between, which is right here. This was over on the tables over there. And this one was on my desk with a higher spike. So you can actually see the tape, tape off, taper off of a particulate uh, over distance. 
And then the same thing, this was sitting earlier in the day. I don't know what was going on over there, but somebody picked up some dust. And you can also see the difference in distribution of uh, size data. So like you can see the different spikes are in different particle size densities. Uh, so anyway, these things are pretty cool. They're really cheap. Uh, we're going to put these outside. Obviously, the data is more relevant to ours. The only thing I'm curious about, though, is to find out how good our dust collection systems in the wood shop and the welding shop are doing. So because they're inexpensive, I'm going to put a few inside the building from the shops heading out this way to try and understand uh, whether or not we are leaking dust into the building that we could take care of with the exhaust systems. Mr. Sean? Is that there's like two pieces of glass and It's bouncing. What it's doing is it's making the cavity longer. So it's actually bouncing back and forth like hundreds of times. They're uh, like parabolic mirrors and it's shooting, mm -hmm. zipping back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay, but I guess the question is, why does that get dirty? Uh, it does, but the idea is that I think the particles are zipping through the chamber fast enough. So the mirrors are over here and the particles are going through the chamber. So they don't touch where the mirrors are. Um, what's crazy is one of these sensors, when I was in college not that long ago, we we bought I bought one. I signed the thing. It's forty thousand uh, dollars. It's about this big uh, cube. It's for a research lab doing engine data. So like this was a scientific lab or lab had like a million dollars in equipment. So this was not a big not a big chunk of it, but it was a uh, liquid nitrogen pool, uh, and it's they're really fast, so you could draw samples through them. So to be able to buy one of these for twenty dollars, <laughs> people online pitched them. Like oh, twenty dollars, it's really expensive. <laughs> Uh, it's crazy. This is nowhere near the fidelity that ours did, but the point is, like, it's again revolutionarily really crazy that you can take a chrome plated piece of plastic and get some data out of it that seems to correlate pretty well with reality. So that's pretty cool. Um, at any rate, yeah, we aren't going to let Mark sweep anymore. I know it's rough. Uh, but yeah, I just so wanted to show this. sweep again, you'd deal more. It, we might, yeah. That's the that would be the interesting part is like if we vacuum versus swept versus whatever, what do you get? Um, so if you're going to put a bunch of these, I assume the outside ones will be connected here. Will you keep the inside ones local data or will you just put it all up there? Or... So it goes online and um, there's actually just a box in here. Like this says indoor. So there's outdoor versus indoor. So the indoors won't show up on the, on the map, I don't think. I think they, they uh, changed the uh, preview, like the plot. Yeah. But yeah, you can have multiple sensors in an area. And, and have all this data sensors. is just posted on there or whatever. So this data is going to a German university, and the German university is actually um, wanting to know how high off the ground are you, and how um, how far away from a road are you, and they're trying to get data about the environment. And the other interesting one, which I don't have set up on this, I had to buy a couple more parts, um, is a digital sound sensor. So rather than use an analog sound, you can use a digital sound sensor, and which takes some more stuff to add on. So I need to put another controller on here. Just throw another mic controller at the problem. That's the way to go. Um, so I need a teensy Arduino, basically control board. Uh, uh, I think it's Freesca mic controller board. Anyway, to go on there to interpret the digital sound data to be fast enough, and then it passes a weighted average to this thing. So it's not actually recording sound; it's just recording weighted averages. Um, but the interesting thing there is to see the tail off of airport and road and whatever other noise, um, just to understand. What that looks like. Don't be hating on diesels. I did studies on diesels, man. There you go. VW, yeah, VW diesels deserve a special place in hell. But um, yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah, kind of a cool thing. Um, if anybody's interested in this, you can make your own. Uh, they are this setup here. Um, it, you can. This one's the expensive one. This was twenty six bucks. The other one that's sitting on my desk is twelve dollars for that particular sensor. This thing's three dollars, which is insane. You get Wi Fi and you get a microcontroller. And then this guy was like two bucks. And this does temperature and pressure. You can spend three dollars and get temperature, pressure, and humidity. Or if you screw up on your order, you get temperature, pressure instead of temperature, pressure, and humidity. But anyway, uh, so for twenty bucks, you can set one of these up. Or for about fifty dollars, you can set up one with sound. Um, the Irony, of course, is I pulled this out this morning, flashed the controller, it flashed just fine, hooked everything up, it didn't, didn't work. I spent like three hours prodding at it, I should ask ChatGPT. Um, three hours like prodding at it and I uh, could not get it to work. And finally was like, you know, this is dumb, I'm just gonna set up a different one. So I set up a different one that worked perfect. 
I don't know what is wrong. One of these boards I pulled off that was bad. So anyway, don't get uh, disheartened if you try to build something that doesn't work right away. But the instructions are really like it's as simple as you know four wires and you're in good shape. So it's pretty pretty easy to set up. And then this gets jammed into a piece of PVC pipe. Um, it's actually ABS pipe because it's from Europe. But and then uh, you run the tube out to sample at the edge, and you run the temperature, pressure, humidity sensor at the edge. And then they're advising just putting a piece of screen over this, and that's it. So um it's a pretty easy way to do it so kind of cool um cheap to build and then this is the more sophisticated one for the microphone uh, the microphone's got to have a pinhole exposed and then uh, they're using a longer pipe because they need to get it out away from a building because you don't want the reflections off the building to interfere with the volume that you're detecting so um yeah the amazing thing to me is that for that cheap you can get wi-fi and a computer in the whole nine hours it's pretty cool so the neat thing with this too is, is you could also control I.O. with it. So pretty easily you could use this to control things. You can use it to sense things. Uh, you can use it for all sorts of stuff. So, that's so are they not, they're not actively pulling the air? They are. Yeah, there's a fan on here. There is. Okay. Yep. This one does continuous sampling. The one on my desk is doing uh, on demand. So it's sucking in. So it's drawing in whatever it needs to. Yeah, you have to pull so the sample. It's the and then it's yep. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yep, it's pulling through a known volume. And then it's uh, checking to see obstruction. And then checking... It gets there's some fancy math going on in there to figure out particle sizing. It's not it's, it's again it's really cool that they can build one for that. Hey, some of those cheap sensors can rate they're limited on the or Yeah, this one can do actually ironically, this is the twenty six dollar one. It does two point five and ten. The eleven dollar one on my desk does one, two point five and ten. But that yeah. one's bracketing. It's like bracketing baskets and this one is showing continuous variation. Okay, so maybe yeah, that picked one up cheap. And then I found out, oh, it doesn't go down to certain size. Yeah. So, yeah, I bought a couple of different variations just to try and see. But any questions? Anybody else got anything I want to share? So, are you going to make this to what Scott was talking about a couple of meetings ago with the HVAC control systems where the dust particulates here equals that fan goes on there? Yeah. We're, well, so the all of our HVAC is all can be network controlled. And then we can do demand-driven ventilation. So you can do CO2 de detection, things like that. Um, this, to me, I mean, we're on a flight path on a railroad, and we generate shit inside. So it's good to understand, like, are you doing a good job generating crap? Or are you doing a good job keeping stuff outside? Sort of what are things doing? Um, you know, you can wipe your finger across the top of the surface periodically and check and see. I mean, I do clean daily, but, you know. <laughs> but, no, uh uh, yeah, it's just it, this has always been interesting to me, and the price and the stuff is just cratered. Uh, like I said, in, in college, I did emissions sampling and things like that. One of the scarier ones is um, we did a thing called a dilution tunnel. So in a dilution tunnel, you run your exhaust gas out of your engine into a big, it's literally just a big-ass tube. And then the tube does the air dilution, and it simulates standing 5 feet from the roadway, 10 feet from the roadway, 15 feet from the roadway. So to me, my brain is very cognizant of like, you do not want to stand by the roadway because I know exactly what's there and it's not good for you. It's really remarkable. Um, the thing that we take for granted is just crapping garbage out of the back of the tailpipe. And I drive a car too, just like everybody else does. But um, we were, that's what I did in school. So, so anyway, air quality and air pollution and things are important. And, uh, it's good that we have sensors that are inexpensive enough. Cause again, it would have been a huge amount of money uh, back in the day to have something like this to be able to test the stuff. So. Uh, are you a or just like it's telling you sizings. Okay. Um, yeah, so this far right chart is PM10. Uh, sorry, folks online. Uh, the far right chart is PM10, uh, so it's 10 micron, uh, 2.5 micron. The, the hazard with 2.5 micron is that it's the size that has enough mass to fly in places. And then when it, when it hits things like your lung tissue, it embeds itself. Uh, PM1 is really teeny. It's like super, super tiny. It doesn't have a lot of inertia. So it's just kind of floating around in the air. Um, and PM10 is big, so it gets jammed into your mucous membranes. But 2.5 is small enough to fly in. And then when it hits something, it embeds itself. It doesn't fly back out again. So that's why we worry about certain size particles, because they're way more hazardous than other size particles. Uh, and also our ability to filter these things is difficult. So kind of like the mass that we have on, they're good at certain size distribution particles and not so good at other size distribution. Uh, and so these are engineered to try and provide an even filtration. And we test them at the hardest possible spot. So like your N95 is a rating at the hardest possible filtration particle for the same reason. 
it's the stuff that wants to fly through the mask and not get trapped. So, so anyway, yeah, so this is showing you um, density in micrograms per cubic meter. So in a cubic meter of air volume in here, how many micrograms of dust at different size levels do we have? Um, so that's what it's doing. These are all small. Uh, where it starts getting dangerous is when you get into the tens and twenties and hundreds. And you'll see that on that larger map. Um, <laughs> there are places where the air is really shitty. And there's also crazily places that the air is really shitty on one side of a building and great on the other side of the building because you're getting sheltering effects. So there's some fun physics stuff going on that way too, where the wind is blowing stuff in one area and, and trapping it. So anything else? I'm uh, 2.5 microns of disappointed that the sensor number they assigned you ends in 76 instead of 67. <laughs> <laughs> I got a whole lot of sensor numbers. So, uh, yeah, there's there's a, each one of these, when you flash it, I think the tool generates a unique ID for you. So um, there's actually a gajillion of these things um, that you can grab data from. So we can see what oh, somebody else doesn't have anything useful. Um, so yeah, these are all different uh, IDs from all the other people. So, all right, anything anybody else wants to share online? I'm going to cut you folks off. But can you pull up the map of the U.S. again? How many did look like there are many people? Yeah, there are not many in the U.S. Um, and that's, really yeah, we were very, we were very early adopter, especially in the, the static map here. It isn't updated. Um, but yeah, it, this was a European university uh, in Germany who was doing this and so these got rolled out in Germany really heavily uh, and then have distributed it in, into Europe as well. The thing that's popular in the US is called purple air and this is the thing that I had looked at um, getting but the problem is that they're selling these sensors for 200 and some plus dollars uh, and so that's way too expensive so they're doing the exact same thing they've got a map of all the data um, but they don't share and they don't so you can't push any data under their map and you can't draw from their map. I don't think maybe you can grab their API, but at any rate, the folks doing this, uh, this map are all open source and it's an open standard and anybody can put data on their map. So I didn't have to like buy their sensor. I can use any sensor I want. Um, oh, my locate. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so anyway, this one is popular in the U S um, and there's a few of these ones in the neighborhood because the neighborhood people were trying to monitor uh, PM as well. Yeah, Jesus, Jim. Um, so yeah, the the density of purple air in the U.S. is really high, and then uh, in Europe is really low. So it's the same old thing if you've got different companies targeting different markets. Uh, you can see Chicago basically kills everybody, and somebody in Upper Michigan apparently's got really terrible air. Um, <laughs> So you don't, doing, yeah, maybe, and you don't know where people have got these things positioned. So, so this is what's goofy, right? Is you've got tons of U.S. centric data, and then like not any European data, and the other services all the European data, but none of the U.S. data. Of course, the European stuff's all open standard, and the U.S. stuff is all <laughs> capitalist bastards. So it's like the opposite map of one another. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, all right. Well, I'm gonna kill off Zoom, and then we'll do some intros here and go from there. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye, all. Thanks. Bye-bye.